Last week, we began a new uh, mini-series on understanding how to hear the voice of God. Very few things are more important than this because you can't have a relationship to God if you can't hear God. If all you do is ever talk to him in prayer and you never hear God speak to you, that's a one-way relationship. That isn't much of a relationship. God wants to speak to you. Now this week, I want us to look at the issue of how do I know when it's God? When I get an idea in my mind, how do I know where that idea came from, that impression, that thought? How do I know it didn't come from the devil or it came from the bad burrito I ate last night? <laughs> or, or it came from uh, my own thoughts, I just thought it up. I mean, you talk to yourself all the time. I talk to myself all the time. I am my own best friend. <laughs> and you're talking, you have a running conversation with you throughout the day. How do I look? How do I feel? What's going on? How should I handle that? Respond to that. And it's very easy to sometimes be confused on, is this God telling me to do this or is this just something I want to do? Do you know what I'm talking about? Is this really just my idea or did God give me this idea? Or did it come to the devil? Or is it some bad tape that I'm playing in the past? It is extremely important you know how to discern when it's God talking to you. Because if you don't, it can be fatal. The Bible says this, if you take out your message notes on Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, what you think is the right road may lead to death. In other words, it can be fatal. And uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, a lot of evil gets blamed on God when people say, well, God told me to do this. The Bible says in 1 John uh, 4, 1, don't believe every message you hear just because someone says it's a message from God. Test it first to see if it really is. Circle the phrase, test it. That's what we're gonna talk about this weekend. I want you to learn seven ways to test an impression from the Bible. It's a very important and practical message so that you can know how to test a message from God. Because the fact is, one moment you can get an idea from God and the next moment you can get an idea from Satan in a split second. Let me give you a classic example of it. One day Jesus is with his 12 disciples and and uh, he, he turns to Peter, one of the 12, and he says, uh, Peter, who do you say that I am? And uh, Peter says, well, Lord, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus looks straight at Peter and he says, right on, Pete. He, sa he says, you have spoken the truth. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. In other words, Peter, that idea didn't come from you. That idea came from God. He said, you're right, you spoke the truth, I am the son of God, and that idea that was put in your mind came from God. It wasn't revealed by flesh and blood. Immediately, Jesus says to Peter, now Peter, I've gotta go to Jerusalem, and I'm gonna be crucified, and I'm gonna die there. And Peter immediately says, that's nonsense, Lord. You can't let them do that to you. And not five seconds later, Jesus looks at Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. What's he saying? He's saying, that thought didn't come from God. That God thought, Peter, that you just spoke came from the devil. That's how quick you can miss it. One minute you can be saying, you're right. That thought came from God, and upon this rock, this truth, I will build my church. And the very next second, you're saying something, and Jesus looks and says, Peter, you didn't get that one from God. That's the devil. Because the devil did not want Jesus to die, because die, in dying on the cross, he would die for the sins of mankind and allow our salvation. And he didn't want that to happen in that way. And knowing that, he said, that thought is from the devil. Now, how do you know? Well, he says, Test it, look at the next verse. Jesus said in John 7, 17, anyone who wants to do God's will, now that's the key, you gotta wanna be willing to do it in advance. 
anyone who wants to do God's will can test this teaching and know whether it's from God or whether I'm making it up. Jesus says, you know what? You can test what I say and you can then know for sure that it's from God. Now, how do you do that? Well, that's what we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at seven ways to test an impression. Now, these seven tests form a filter. And if you get an idea from God, or you get an idea in your mind, you're going, now, did I just think that up? Or is that from the devil? Or is that some old tape that my great grandmother said or something? Or is that really from the Holy Spirit? You test it by these seven tests. And if it passes all seven, then you can know for certain it's from God. Now, you can't pick and choose. You can't say, well, that passed test one, three, five, and seven, but it didn't pass two, four, and six. No, no, it's got to pass all seven. But if an idea that you have passes all seven tests, then you can know absolutely certain, and God wants you to know this, that you have heard from God. That God put that idea in your mind and it is something he wants you to do. All right, let's look at these seven tests from the Bible. The first test, there's seven questions. The first question is, does it agree with the Bible? Does the idea that I've got in my mind right now, that thought, that impression, does it agree with the Bible? Because God's will will never contradict God's word what he's already said. God doesn't say one thing and then change his mind and say another thing. If he said it, it's true, and it will always be true. See, God is consistent. God isn't moody. God doesn't change his mind. God will never tell you to violate a principle that he's already given in his word, the Bible, the word of God. He won't tell you to ignore this book. He'll never tell you to disobey this book. So the first question you ask is, does this line up with what God has already said? And if what I have in my mind contradicts something God has already said, then I know I'm wrong, that it didn't come from God, because truth is eternal. Notice these verses, Luke 21, 33, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never, circle that, never pass away. God's word is eternal. The earth isn't eternal, the universe isn't eternal, but God's word is eternal because truth never changes. If something was true 5,000 years ago, it was true 1,000 years ago. It is true today and it will be true 5,000 years from today because truth doesn't change. Opinions change, science changes, scientific discoveries change. I mean, the science textbook's out of date almost instantly the moment it's, who wants to buy last year's uh, you know, uh, computer book? It's out of date. But God's word doesn't change and truth never changes. In fact, if it's new, it's not true. What do you mean by that? I'm saying it's always, if it's true, it's been around forever. We just discover it. For instance, um, many years ago, we discovered that the world was round. Prior to that, people believed the world was flat. Now, the world was never flat, it's always been round. It's always been round even when we didn't believe it was round, okay? It was true whether you believe it or not. People say, God said it, that, I believe it, that settles it. Well, no, God said it, that settles it whether you believe it or not. <laughs> because God cannot lie. I lie, you lie, but God cannot lie. And so God always tells you the truth. And if he told you in this book to do something, then he's never gonna contradict it. So the first question I ask is, is this idea in harmony with the word of God? Uh, for instance, let me give you some examples. Uh, in the book of Romans, the Bible tells us, pay your taxes. We are commanded as good citizens to pay our taxes. And Jesus said, um, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and unto God the things that are God's. Now, if all of a sudden you get an idea, God told me to not pay my taxes this year. <laughs> that wasn't God. Okay, that wasn't God. Because God has already said, pay your taxes and he's not gonna contradict it. 
Um, if I go over here to the book of Proverbs, there's a bunch of principles for how to have a successful business in the book of Proverbs. And one of the principles is God says, I bless businesses with integrity. Businesses that are fair in every business dealing, businesses that are just, businesses that are honest. And so if you get an idea that, well, you know what, I could make a little bit bigger profit this year if I just shaved a little. I know it wouldn't be quite right. If I was a little dishonest, my profits could increase. That idea did not come from God because it contradicts what God has already said. The Bible tells us that sex is not dirty. Sex is holy. God thought it up. It was his idea. And God created sex to be the glue between a husband and a wife. And many times in scripture, God says, sex is to be reserved only for a husband and a wife in the bonds of a marriage. Now, you may not like that, but it doesn't make it untrue. And you may say, well, I want to go out and have sex with whoever I want to have sex with. Well, fine, but you didn't get that idea from God. That's your idea. And don't say, God told me to go have sex with that person, because he didn't. <laughs> That's a good pickup line. Going to a bar. God told, God told me you're to have sex with me, right? Well, that's the God card. You don't play the God card in dating, okay? All right? Now, the Bible says that even if some angel showed up and came along and said, oh, by the way, I've got some new revelation, I've got some stuff to add to this book. Uh, yeah, that's good, but here's the new stuff. This is the new revised, and we're going to update it. We're going to give you one or two or more other books besides the Bible. God says, you know, that's not right. In fact, here's what the Bible says, Galatians chapter 1. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including myself, Paul says, who preaches any other message. Even if an angel comes from heaven and preaches any other message. Says, no, no, the Bible's not enough. You gotta add this to it. You gotta add this revelation. You gotta add this book. You gotta add this thought. If anybody else adds to it, he goes, let him be cursed. The Bible says this again in Revelation. You may not add to what God has already said. The second test is, when I get an idea, I ask, does this make me more like Christ? Does this idea make me more like Christ. Jesus is the standard by which I evaluate every thought, every idea, every philosophy, every opinion, every fad, every opinion. I, I, I hold it up against Jesus Christ. Why? Because God's purpose in your life is to make you like Jesus. We've talked about this many times. Why doesn't God just take you to heaven. Why did God put you on earth for 80 years and then take you to heaven? Why doesn't he just create you and take you to heaven? Why does he put you here on earth for 80 years? You ever thought about that? I mean, he could have just taken you straight to heaven. He put you here because life is a test and a trust and a temporary assignment. He wants you to practice the things you're gonna do in heaven and he wants you to become like Jesus Christ in character. That's gonna involve some problems and going through the things Jesus went through. Now. Um, life is tough. Everybody agree with that? Life is hard because nothing works on this planet correctly. Everything is broken. Every body is broken. Every mind is broken. Every relationship is broken. There is nothing perfect. There's no perfect marriage, no perfect economy, no perfect church, no perfect country. The weather is broken. We just saw that this week. The environment is broken all because of sin. Heaven is gonna be the place where we relax and have fun. Right now, God is more interested in your character than your comfort. And he wants you to grow up and become like Jesus. Now look at these verses. The Bible says, in your lives you must think and act like Jesus Christ. God says, I, Jesus is the model. And in the next verse, we take every thought captive. In other words, we test every thought. We test every thought so it's obedient to Christ. So we ask, it means that when I get an idea, the first thing I ask is, now would Jesus do this? Would Jesus think this? Would Jesus feel this way? Would Jesus act this way? Because he's the standard, he's the second filter. What would Jesus do is a good question. 
It's a good question. Because I want to be like Christ. Now, God gives a specific checklist. Because you say, well, what's Jesus like? Well, he's the fruit of the Spirit. God says Jesus is love and he's joy and he's peace and he's patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness and meekness and self-control. But here's another passage I want us to look at. James chapter 3 gives us some things that Jesus is and some things that Jesus isn't. And if you get an idea, this is a good filter or grid to test the idea. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, such wisdom, in other words, those thoughts, those ideas, those impressions, such, quote, wisdom, that's of the devil. You know where those ideas came from. The wisdom that comes from God, the, the ideas, the impressions, the thoughts that come from God, that wisdom is pure, it's peace-loving, it's considerate, it's submissive and full of mercy, it's impartial and sincere. Now notice, he says, here's a test. There are two things you can know an idea is not from God, and there's seven things you can know it is an idea that is from God. It's not God's wisdom and it is God's wisdom. First he says, it's not an idea from God if it's motivated by bitterness or envy. What do you mean by that? God says, if I get an idea on how to get even with somebody, how to get revenge with somebody, how to retaliate to somebody, and I say, you know what, that person hurt me. How can I get them back? Oh, I know, I'm gonna get them good. This is a good idea. I know how I'll embarrass them. I know how I'll hurt them back. He says, that idea didn't come from God, that came from the devil. That's a satanic idea. It's a satanic idea. An idea to retaliate, to get even, to get revenge, those ideas do not come from God. And then he says also, if it's based on envy, if I go out and say, you know what? I'm going to buy this car so people will envy me. I'm going to buy this pair of shoes, this shirt. I'm going to buy this dress so people will be jealous of me. And they're going to look at me and they're going to envy and be jealous of me. God says, you didn't get that idea from me. It didn't come from me. Because he says, that's from the devil. That wisdom comes from Satan. And then he says also, if it's motivated by selfish ambition... He said, any idea motivated by selfish ambition does not come from God. God doesn't give you self-serving ideas. You come up with plenty of them yourself. He doesn't have to create them for you. You think them up all the time. And so, you know, if you say, I've got a great idea that's just gonna make me filthy rich and everybody's gonna worship me and everybody's gonna be envious of me and jealous of me and I'm gonna be the king of the heap and the top dog, and everybody else is gonna be underneath me, and I'm gonna be number one. God said, you didn't get that idea from me. Selfish ambition, God said, I didn't put you on earth to bless your selfish ambition. That's not what I put you on earth to do, to live for yourself. See, a lot of people try to use God for their own personal ambition. And they say, well now God told me to do this, and that's the trump, how, how, do, you, how do you trump God? And, and, but where did that come from? He says it came from, from the devil. And he says, now, if you get an idea and it's from God, it's going to be one of these things. Pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, you know, uh, impartial and sincere. So let's look at these. First, if I get an idea, an impression from God is going to be pure. So if I get an impure thought, that one obviously did not come from God. And it says, if I get an idea from God, it's going to be peace-loving. What does that mean? It means when God gives you an idea, it promotes harmony, not conflict. It promotes reconciliation, not division, not war, not separation. God is not gonna give you an idea that's, that to create conflict in your family, to create conflict in your small group, to create conflict at work, to create conflict at church or somewhere else. To, to divide people into this side and that side. He says, real wisdom is peace loving. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. They are the children of God. The people who build bridges, not build walls. And in life, you're either a bridge builder or you're a wall builder. He says, be peace loving. Now what does that mean? It means all gossip is satanic. It doesn't come from God. 
It's satanic. Why? Because the Bible says Satan is the accuser. He is the accuser of Christians. He is the condemner of Christians. His job is to put you down. His job is to condemn you, to criticize you. When you criticize, condemn, and gossip about others, you're just doing the devil's work for you. He says, thank you very much. All gossip is satanic. It's not from God. It's not pure. It's not peace-loving. And number three, it's not considerate. The third thing I ask is, I got this idea, would it hurt anybody else? Would it harm anybody else? Now, if I get an idea and it'll really help me, but it hurts everybody else, that idea isn't from God. If I get an idea and it's gonna help me, but it's gonna hurt everybody else in my family, it's gonna hurt my wife and my kids, that idea did not come from God. It's real simple. Because wisdom from God is considerate. God is concerned about the effects on other people. And then it says, real wisdom, our ideas, impressions from God, are submissive. What does that mean? Submissive is humble. Submissive is teachable. Submissive is willing to have your idea checked by somebody else. What do you think? When you say to somebody else, what do you think about this idea? You are submitting that idea to them. And so to have an idea from God, if it's really from God, you're more than willing to say to your small group, what do you guys think about this? Guys, if you have an idea and you don't really wanna tell your wife about this idea, it didn't come from God. Okay, because you're not willing to submit it to say, what do you think about this, honey? Uh, uh, wives, if you get an idea and you don't really want to check it out with your husband, like, should I buy this? <laughs> well, guess what? That's not a submissive attitude. Humble and teachable. If an idea is from God, the Bible says it is submissive. That means you're willing to have it tested. What do you guys think? And, and you ask around and you, you, know, you ask your small group and you know, or you ask the people you're working with, your staff, you say, what do you guys think about this idea? You see, when people are prideful and they're unteachable and they are self-righteous, it is a dead giveaway that they're not hearing from God because the wisdom of God is pure, peace-loving, considerate, and submissive. Number five, it says, if I get an idea from God, an impression from God, it's full of mercy. What does that mean? It means if I get an idea from God, it's gonna make me more forgiving of you. It's gonna make me more gracious to you. I'm thinking, man, I've been forgiven. I better forgive everybody else. God has been gracious to me. I better be gracious to everybody else. I say, you know, God has cut me an awful lot of slack. I better cut my wife an awful lot of slack and my kids an awful lot of slack. Why? Because God has been gracious to me. True wisdom, wisdom that comes from God, not human wisdom, not demonic wisdom, but God's wisdom is full of mercy. You know, some people, this is the, the dead giveaway that they haven't heard from God. They think they have, but they haven't because their attitude proves it. When you find people who think they've heard from God and then they're judgmental, and they're critical of everybody else, and they're harsh, and they're accusatory, and they're always judging other people, and other churches, and other leaders, and things like that, you know they have not heard from God. Now it just seems that all those people have congregated on the internet. <laughs> and they have these things called blogs. Let me tell you something, it takes no intelligence to criticize. A fool, an idiot can criticize. Anybody, a, a, a baby can learn to criticize. You could teach a monkey how to criticize. <laughs> but it takes maturity and wisdom to find the beauty in every person. It's very easy to look at something and go, she's this, she's this, she's this, she's this, he's that, he's that, he's that, he's that. And you look at all the surface issues and you can instantly think of five things you don't like about them. It takes no brains at all to do that. What takes intelligence, what takes wisdom, what takes maturity is to find the good, the beautiful in every person and in every situation. That takes maturity. 
Now, it's full of mercy. That means you're going to be gracious to other people if it's an idea from God. And then it says, it's wisdom from God is impartial and sincere. Now, this means you don't use what God tells you to manipulate other people. The words insincere and uh, uh, sincere and impartial are actually in Greek the words adikritos and anipokritos. We get the word hypocrite from adikritos and anipokritos. It means hypocrite. You know what a hypocrite is? You wear a mask. You're a fake. You're phony. You're not authentic. You talk one way with this group and another way with this group. When you do that, you're not hearing from God. If it's an idea, it's right out front and it's the same with every person. And you don't try to manipulate or control other people by saying, well, now God told me. And then you go, well, how do you fight with God? I mean, that's, that's like the ultimate weapon. To throw down. Well, God told me. Da, da. And then you go, well, okay, I guess we better do it. No, that means if it's really from God, you don't do that. Now, Tom is going to come and teach us the third filter. The third way you test an impression is you ask, does my church family confirm it? Does my church family confirm it? You ask other mature believers, what do you think about this idea? You might check with God's word, might check with uh, the other filters, but does my church family confirm it? Now, why is this one so important? Because you were not meant to live life all alone. You were meant to live life in relationship to other people. And so you go to others, other mature people who are trying to follow Christ as well, and you say, what do you think about this? This is why it's so important that you have a church family. Listen to what the Bible says about this in Ephesians 3.10. God's intent is that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known. Through the church, God's wisdom is made known into all eternity and to each one of us individually. He wants to use other people in your life, in my life. Now, what does this mean? This means that if God has genuinely spoken to you, other believers, other people who are following Christ are going to confirm it when you talk to them about it. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, I can see that. This also means if you get an idea, an impression, something from God, and you think, maybe I should do this for this area of my life or for a relationship or for my business, and you have a resistance to telling anybody else about it, that should be a huge red flag. I don't want to tell anybody else. It's either, you know, I look at myself. I like to think things through and make plans. And if I'm resistant to telling somebody else, a lot of times it's just my pride. I just want to feel like I made it up all by myself. It's either my pride or it could be in the back of your mind, you know it's the wrong thing to do and you know what they're going to say when you tell them so you just don't want to tell them. You, pre you test the impression with other people because you realize that they're going to confirm it. If you get some idea, crazy idea, that you can't find any other person who's trying to follow Christ to confirm it, guess what? It's wrong. So you just throw it out, you drop it, and you realize I'm going to go on to the next idea. If mature believers, what I'm saying is this, if mature believers question it, you should question it too. Now, why does God want us to get advice from other people? Because he wants to save us from a lot of things. Next verse in your outline says, the wisdom of the righteous can save you. Now, what can it save you? It can save you a lot of time, wasted time in doing the wrong thing. It can save you a lot of pain, pain in making a mistake. I'd rather learn from somebody else's pain than have the pain myself. Can you agree with that one? No doubt about that. It can save you a lot of embarrassment. It can even save your reputation. Sometimes it can save your life. That's how important advice from other people can be in your life. One of the biggest reasons we mess up our lives is either we have no godly friends, no one else in our lives that we can talk to who's trying to follow God and live life the kind of way he's made for us to live, or I've got some friends, but I just won't listen to them in this case. I just want to do what I want to do no matter what. So I've got to build godly relationships into my life. Now, this, this is why every one of us, we need something in our lives. You probably know what it is. We all need a small group. You know this already. In fact, most of you are in a small group, but maybe you were in one and you've gotten out of one, or you've never been in one, and it's just it's the time, it's just the hassle. It's, if you're not in a small group, you're skating on thin ice and you don't know where the thin ice is. You need some other people in your life that you can bounce some things off of. The relationships aren't just every once in a while, I'll try to call, you gotta build them in on a regular basis. I can't tell you how many times in our small group someone has said something 
And I, I wasn't even thinking to ask him about it, but just what they said, it caused me to think in a different direction, in a different way. That's the power of relationships, what God wants to do in our lives. You need a small group for feedback when it comes to hearing from God, impressions from God. Proverbs 11:14 says, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So if you want to make fewer mistakes, then you get all the godly advice that you can get and you follow it. With one big disclaimer on that one. There, there are some people, they've got an idea and they go ask 10 people and they realize it's wrong. So then they go ask 99 people, just looking for one person who will agree with them. I'm not saying to do that. What you do is you just find some people that are trying to follow Christ, trying to live the kind of life God's given us to live, and you ask them, and you allow them to be a part of testing God's impressions in your life. Now, the fourth test is a test that will save you an awful lot of money if you'll really listen to it. I have met so many well-meaning Christians who've gone off and started businesses and then they failed and they lost a lot of money from it because they didn't go through this fourth test. And uh, they, they would say, well, you know, it passed the first three. I want to start this business. Does it agree with the Bible? Yeah, it's not unbiblical. Uh, does it make me more like, more like Christ? Yes, I can become more like Christ in starting this business. Uh, does my small group confirm it? And the church family and other mature, they say, yeah, you'd be good at that. Try that. Uh, but they didn't really look at the fourth test. And the fourth test is this. Is it consistent with how God shaped me? Is this idea that I've got, this impression, this thought, is it consistent with how God has shaped me? Now, before you were born, God decided what he wanted you to do with your life. And then he formed you, he shaped you for that specific task. He doesn't want you to be somebody you're not. He doesn't want you to pretend to be a copy of somebody else. He made you to be you. We've talked about this often over the years. It's called your shape, S-H-A-P-E. Your spiritual gift, your heart, your abilities, your personality, and your experiences. These are the five things that make you you. Now this shape determines your significance, what you're supposed to do. Form follows function, function follows form, and the way God formed you determines what your function is. The Bible says this in Ephesians 2.10. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Did you know that God created you to do good works? Why are you here on this earth? God created you to do good works, and they're unique to you. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Before you were even born, God knew what he wanted you to do, so he shaped you for that work. The Bible says we're his workmanship. That word in Greek is the word poema. It means poem. We get the word poem from it. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's poem. You are God's work of art. There's nobody like you. Quit trying to be somebody else. You are God's workmanship. He's, you are his handicraft. And he broke the mold when he made you. Now your shape reveals your purpose. You look at something and you see how it's shaped and you know what it's shaped for. This right here, this is shaped, looks like it's shaped to hold stuff, music. Okay, this right here, I look at this and I see the shape of this. Is this shape to sit on? <laughs> I don't think so, okay? No, it's shaped to hold this, this guitar. Now, I look over there and I see a stool with a big round bottom and I think, hmm, that would fit my big round bottom, okay? And I think that is shaped to sit on. Now, I look at this microphone. Is this shaped to sit on? No, I wouldn't want to sit on that puppy, okay? So shape determines purpose. You are shaped in a certain way. God has given you certain abilities and talents. If you have a musical ability and you're shaped in music, God expects you to use it. He never gives you a talent, he, he wants you to waste. Now we have 10 different campuses here at Saddleback. That means we need lots of musicians, both singers and instrumentalists. And you should be using that talent for the glory of God. On the other hand, if you can't carry a tune in a baggie, <laughs> if, if you're tone deaf, 
please, don't go on American Idol. <laughs> I mean, you know, in that early stage when they have like the cattle call and thousands of people show up for American Idol, you, it's very obvious that a lot of those people has nobody who loved them. <laughs> because if they really loved them, they would say, don't embarrass yourself. Don't even try, okay? You're a prison singer. You're always behind a few bars. You never have the right key, okay? <laughs> so, so just forget it. And obviously, they go out there and they make a mess of themselves, okay? Now, what you're good at is a good indication of what you should do with your life. Now, if you like hanging out with children, you love little children, or you like working with teenagers, then you should be involved in the student ministry and the children's ministry of Saddleback Church. Because we have thousands of kids and teenagers who desperately need adult mentors. They need you. And you should be involved in that if you have a passion, a heart for them. On the other hand, if you say, I'm not good with little kids. I'm not good with teenagers. Don't sweat it. There's a lot of other things you can do with your life. We're all good at different things. Uh, the Bible says this in Romans 12, 6, on the back of your outline. God has given each of us the ability to do certain things well, which implies that there are certain things you don't do well. Okay? Nobody is good at everything. And that's why we need each other. And that's why we need a small group, because we, we help each other out. So in this question, you want to ask, what am I good at? What, what do I love to do? But more than what do I love to do, what am I really good at? You discover a lot of God's will by simply looking at how God has shaped you. Now, just because you love to do it doesn't mean you should do it. Uh, many of you know that before I was a pastor, I was a worship leader. I've played guitar since I was a kid. I had a band when I was in, in high school. And, uh, and, and I love to sing. The only problem was nobody liked to listen to it. <laughs> so I discovered that just because I... I like to sing doesn't mean I should sing, okay? So I quickly got wise and shifted gears. And when you're doing what you're good at doing, people go, hey, you're good at that, okay? And, th and they will tell you. Um, you, you. If you get an impression from God that is totally opposite of what you are shaped to be, it didn't come from God. You can know. It didn't, that idea did not come from God. It may have been something my parents wanted me to do, and I feel pressured to do it because they wanted me to do it, or my wife wants me to do it, or my husband wants me to do it, but I'm not shaped to do it, so don't do it, because you, your shape determines God's will for your life. You know, a while back, I uh, was invited to speak on the USS Stennis, which is a nuclear powered aircraft carrier out in the Pacific with 9,000 sailors on it. It's a floating city. And it was so cool. And they invited me out in the Pacific during the middle of war games. So I get on this cod plane, which is a little plane that has a tail hook on it. And you come flying in to this aircraft carrier and the tail hook catches the the, the cord, and you go from 355 miles an hour to zero in about two seconds. It's really cool. <laughs> the G-force on that beats all the things that Magic Mountain put together. It, I mean, it's a Z-ticket ride. I'm going, now that's cool. And so then I spoke to these, stu uh, these uh, sailors, 9,000 sailors, and and uh, the admiral, and had a great time there. And then, then when I'm flying off, you, you, they they literally propel you like a, like a, you know, a, a jet is just pushed off uh, very quickly and, uh, and, and, and this, this thing just pushes the, this little cod plane and you go again from zero to about 355, 50 miles an hour in about 400 yards. It just takes off and it is so cool. <laughs> now, if I came home and I said to you, God has spoken to me. <laughs> and I am to resign Saddleback Church as pastor, and I'm going to go become a top gun. <laughs> well, I'm not shaped to be a top gun. First place, I wouldn't fit in a cockpit, 
okay? I'm too tall, I'm too big to fit in a cockpit. Second, I have almost zero hand-eye coordination. So you wouldn't want me flying one of those $21 billion jets. And I'm not shaped to do it. I may like to do it, but if I'm not shaped, I shouldn't do it. Does that make sense? Okay. Sometimes people get a dream and they hear this thing, well, you can be anything you want to be. I'll tell you right now, that's just not true, friends. Okay. I mean, I don't care who Oprah or Tony Robbins or anybody tells you, you can be whatever you want to be. You're never going to be an opera singer. No matter how hard you try, you're never going to be Kobe. You're never going to shoot hoops like he does, okay? Because you are shaped in a certain way. You can be all God shaped you to be. And you better be happy with that, and that's where you're going to find fulfillment, not trying to be somebody that you think you ought to be. God's leading will not contradict what he's gifted you to do. Okay, number five, the fifth test. Does it concern my responsibility? Does it concern my responsibility? Now, if it's not your responsibility, why should God talk to you about it? In other words, if God wants to talk to somebody else, he can talk directly to them. Every believer has direct access to God. He doesn't really need to go through you. And so stop trying to get God's word for somebody else. Is it your responsibility? A good example of this, again, is going back to Peter. Peter, uh, at the end of Jesus' time on earth, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, one day uh, you're gonna die for me. You're going to be martyred. They're gonna put you in chains. And he's telling Peter in advance, you're gonna die a horrible death because you're gonna be martyred for me. Now, Peter isn't happy with that. He immediately looks at his buddy, fellow disciple John, and goes, what about him? <laughs> Human behavior. Human behavior. What about, what about John? And, and Jesus basically says, it's none of your beeswax. It's none of your business. Okay? And, and, and Jesus says this here in John 21, 22. Jesus says, if I want him, that's John, the, the other disciple, if I want him to remain alive till I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. In other words, don't worry about what other people, don't try to figure out their lives. You follow me. What is that to you? Circle that. What is that to you? Now, Kay has what I consider to be a classic message on this text. And, and if you haven't heard it, you need to get it on tape and listen to it. And she, Kay calls this the witty principle. W-I-T-T-Y. What is that to you? And Kay says, you know, we always get in trouble when we ignore the witty principle. When we start trying to be the Holy Spirit for somebody else. When we start trying to be God for somebody else. And, and God is saying, hey, I'm talking to you. Are you listening? I'm talking to you. Not what I want to say to you to say to your husband or to your wife or your kids or your parents or your boss. What is that to you? Let, let you work on you. He's saying, don't judge other people. Stop being so judgmental and you just get your own act together. Now, what is he saying here? That when I want to hear God's voice, when I want to listen for an impression, I want to hear God speak, I need to listen for me. Not for somebody else who's in trouble, not for somebody else I want to change, but I need to listen for me. And when God speaks to you, he's going to speak to you about you in your current situation about things you need to change. Not somebody else. It's going to be your responsibility. It'll be relevant to you. You see, it's quite presumptuous to assume that you can hear God speak for somebody else. You need to be very, very careful about that. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 14. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? In other words, that person isn't your servant, that person's God's servant. To his own master, that's God, God is his master. To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So you quit picking on him, or her. 
It says, who are you to judge? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, you've all heard this phrase. God told me to tell you. <laughs> that phrase has done more damage than you could possibly imagine. God told me to tell you. I'd be very careful in that one. God told me to tell you you're going to get well. Oh, really? Are you sure of that? God told me to tell you what you ought to do. Really? Why didn't God just tell me directly? God told me to tell you what's wrong in your life. I remember, it was probably 20 years ago, after a service, I was out on the patio and a woman came up to me and she says, Pastor Rick, God has revealed to me your secret sin. <laughs> I looked at her and I said, well, I guess it's not a secret anymore. <laughs> and then I said, I looked her straight in the face. I said, ma'am, I don't believe you. And she was shocked. Like I was automatically just supposed to accept it because she said the word God. God had told me, and how would I dare question that God had told her? I said, I don't believe you. She said, why not? I said, because I just talked to him. <laughs> I said, in fact, I've been talking to him straight for all morning for about three hours. Because even when I'm preaching, I'm talking to God. I got a two-track mind, and I'm talking to God about the people while I'm talking to you about God. And I said, every service in this church, I'm backstage saying, God, I humble myself before you, and if there's any sin in my life that would hold back your blessings from your people, please reveal it to me right now, and I will clearly and quickly and instantly confess it and repent of it, because I don't want anything holding back blessing from my people. So show it to me. And you know what? He didn't show me anything, so I don't think you heard from him. I think she went to Calvary Chapel. I never saw her again after that. I mean, I, I, you know, some other church, you know, I'm just, I don't know. But uh, you need to be very, very careful that Satan can discredit the Lord's work when well-meaning, I mean, she was sincere, well-meaning Christians assume God's role. You are not the Holy Spirit to your wife, to your kids, or to anybody else. He said, wait a minute, does God ever speak to you, Rick, through other people? Of course he does. Does God ever speak to other people through you, Rick? Of course he does. But you must be very, very careful. And there are three guidelines I want you to write down. You must write these down. Because otherwise you're gonna get into trouble on this one. Three guidelines, if God is gonna speak to you about somebody else, you need to follow these three guidelines. Number one, be patient and pray. Don't immediately go and just blab it to that person when God has given you a word about somebody else. You wait, you be patient, you pray, you make sure you heard from God, and you give God a chance to speak to them directly first. All we are saying is give God a chance. Give him a chance to, to speak directly. In fact, sometimes God will tell you what he intends to tell somebody else so that you can pray for them so that they will be receptive to receiving it when God tells them directly. He doesn't have any intention of you saying it anyway, but he's telling you so you can pray for them. And God will give you an insight into somebody else's life and you can pray for them and say, God, may they be receptive when you tell them that. Okay, so you be, you be patient, you pray, you don't be in a hurry. Second thing, you need to understand, God will use you to confirm what he's already said to them. Now that happens all the time. Okay, that happens all the time. Sometimes God will tell you something and you will say it to another person and they'll go, you know, I've been feeling that. And I, I just wasn't sure that it was God. But I was, I was thinking about that and I felt like God was telling me to do that. And often God will use a human being to confirm in another person's life what he has already said to them directly. 
It's, yeah, you did hear me correctly. It, this happens to me all the time. And I'll, I'll say things to somebody and they go, oh, you know what? I really felt like God was telling me that and that's just a confirmation. Th th that's very, very common. Uh, you know, almost a year uh, before I, well, I wasn't that quite that long, but it was a long time before I took Kay out on our first date. God told me I was gonna marry her. I hadn't even dated her. Now, when I was, got that impression from God, God said, you're gonna marry that girl. I immediately doubted it for four reasons. One, God had never before or never since spoken to me that clearly. I'm saying never before and never since spoken to me that clearly. Number two, I wasn't in love with her. Three, she wasn't in love with me. Four, she was in love with another guy. Okay? So, God says, you're gonna marry that girl. I made no attempt to even date her. I just filed it in the back of my mind. Now, I didn't immediately go to her and say, God's told you to marry me. <laughs> no, that's beating people over the head. In fact, I never told her that until after we were married. Because love is a choice. And, and, and you can't beat people. That's not a dating technique. God told you to date me. Okay, God told me to tell you to date me. Yeah, right, okay. Um, no, that doesn't work that way. But God told me that. It was about six months later. I had a partner, a prayer partner named Danny. And uh, while we were in college, every morning we would get up at, at 5 a.m. and we would go out to the baseball field of the university we were going to and we would kneel down in the dugout and we would pray from about 5 a.m. to about 6 a.m., and we did it for an entire year, or the, the semester, I mean, you know, the, the nine months of school. And uh, this is about six months later, one day we're praying in the morning, and all of a sudden Danny stops, and in the middle of his prayer, he looks over and he goes, Rick, you may think this is weird, but I just have this impression that you're gonna marry Kay Lewis. And I looked at him and said, oh, God told me that six months ago, keep praying. <laughs> Really, and I just, it was just kind of matter of fact, okay? Now, what was God doing there? He was confirming in my heart, yeah, you really did hear from me. You really, you really did hear from me. And God was doing that. Now, that wasn't the conf confirmation for Kay, that was the confirmation for me, okay? And God had to do whatever he wanted to do in, in her life. So you gotta be patient and pray, you gotta, realize that it's usually going to be for confirmation. Third thing, write this down. God usually uses you without you being conscious of it. When God wants to speak through you to another person, it's usually going to be done in a way that you don't even know he spoke through you. And that is so cool. And that happens all the time. You're at a small group and somebody will say something and they don't even realize what they're saying, but it hits you like an arrow straight to your heart. And you go, whoa, that was meant for me. And God just spoke to you through the mouth of somebody in your small group. That's why if you're not in a small group, you're missing that. You're missing that. You don't have anybody who's speaking in, into you. Godly people who can speak into your life. But that person doesn't even know that they did it. I mean, people tell me all the time, Pastor Rick, when you teach, I feel like you're speaking directly to me. I feel like you've been reading my mail. I'm not reading your mail. I'm not even reading your email, okay? All I'm doing is I'm getting up and teaching the Word of God, and one thought will go and hit somebody here, and another one will hit somebody over here, and somebody over here, and I'm not even aware of it. But you're aware of it, because God wanted it for you. And he had me say something that he wanted you to hear even though I didn't know what it was that you needed to hear. Now that happens all the time. Romans 14 says this about concerning my own responsibility. We will all be judged one day, not by each other's standards, thank God, <laughs> or even our own standards, but by the judgment of God, because God is just, right, fair, and true, and nobody's gonna say you're not fair. It is to God alone that we will have to answer for our actions. Now, number six, 
Tom's gonna come and teach on these last two uh, filters. Is it convicting rather than condemning? That's the sixth text. Tom's gonna explain this. Is it convicting rather than condemning? If you miss this one, the difference between being convicting and condemning, you're going to find yourself, even though it passes all the other tests, constantly making decisions because you thought you've heard God's voice, but really it's this voice of condemnation. So what's the difference between conviction that the Bible talks about where God convicts us when we've done something wrong so we can get right, and this general feeling of condemnation? Conviction comes from God. He gives it to us to correct us. So I say something to one of my kids that I shouldn't have said, or to my husband, my wife. God says, you shouldn't talk like that. That's conviction. And he does it to correct us because he loves us, because he wants us to live the right kind of way and enjoy the kind of lives that he made us to live. He wants to develop our character. And conviction is something that God is just saying in my life, this needs to change, so I know what I need to change. On the other hand, condemnation comes from Satan, and it's just to criticize. It's just to accuse you. It's motivated by Satan's hatred for you, and it just gives you this overall feeling, I'm a jerk, I'm worthless, why did I do that? If you've ever, and I think we've all felt this way, just felt vaguely guilty, just this cloud, this dark cloud of guilt hanging over your head, but you couldn't put your finger on it, you just felt bad all the time, that is, that is condemnation. And when you feel that way, that's not from God. If you feel, I'm worthless, I'm useless, I'm nothing, I'm not worth a thing, that is not God's voice. Now, how do I know that? Look at this next verse in your outline, Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. God does not speak that way. He does not speak with a voice of condemnation. So anytime you feel that way, you can know that's not God's voice. And I know a lot of people, to try to get rid of this general feeling of condemnation, they'll do all kinds of crazy things, thinking somehow you're following God's voice. It is never his voice. In fact, you might write down in your outline these words, God never attacks my value. He never attacks your value. Now, will he point out your sin? Oh, yeah, of course but he doesn't attack your value. You're his child. You're the one that he loves. That's not the way that God speaks. Revelation 3, verse 19. Here's how God speaks in my life. Here's how God speaks in your life. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I tell their faults, and I convict, and I discipline. So be earnest and repent changing your mind and attitude. That's how God speaks. Condemnation is like this dark cloud of guilt. When God speaks, it's like a pinpoint of light. He tells you exactly, this is what's wrong, and this is how you change it. So now let's change it together. That's how he speaks in my life. That's how he speaks in your life. He tells you the solution, and then as soon as you confess, as soon as you change, that feeling of conviction, it goes away. It doesn't last for the rest of eternity. Condemnation is general, it's vague, and it never goes away. Conviction, it's specific, it's clear, and it goes away as soon as you respond to it. Well, let me give you another picture of this. It's like, it's like the court system. In, in our court system, you've seen all these courtroom dramas, or some of you are in court every day of your life. In our court system, there's really two stages if you're convicted or condemned. First you have the, first you have the stage where you have all the sentencing going on, and you have the conviction. You are guilty. And then after that does come the sentencing from the judge and you are condemned to this certain punishment. That's our court system. God's system is not the same. God's system doesn't have two parts, it has three parts. First comes the conviction, the feeling, I've done something wrong, I know I shouldn't have gone that way. And then secondly, here's the good news, Jesus takes the condemnation. That's what the cross is all about. Jesus died on the cross because he loves us, and he took our condemnation for us. And so then third, when I recognize that, I am forgiven, I am set free. That's God's system of justice. It's an awesome system of justice. It's a good news God. And so when I'm convicted and I realize I've done something wrong, how long should that feeling that I have of conviction last in my life? It should last only, it should last only as long as it takes me to repent. 
If it takes me a month to repent, I'm going to feel conviction for a month. If it takes me a year to repent, I'm going to feel it for a year. But if immediately, as soon as God says it, I respond to it, then I know, okay, he's speaking to me. You just recognize so many times we mistake our low self-esteem for God's voice. The Bible says this about Satan. Satan is the accuser of believers, Revelation 12, verse 10. He wants to accuse you. You gotta understand how Satan works with your sin. When it comes to sin, before you sin, Satan minimizes it. Have you noticed this? And then after you sin, he maximizes it. Before you sin, he says, oh, it's no big deal. Everybody's doing it. Don't worry about it. And then the minute you sin, you hear Satan's voice saying, how could you do that and call yourself a Christian? How in the world could, you are the worst slime in the universe that you did that. That's how he speaks. So what do I do? I realize that is the voice of Satan and not of God. So I'm going to look to God, and when I feel conviction, I'm going to immediately respond. Is it conviction, convicting or condemning? That's one of the tests. And then you come to the seventh test. And that test is, do I feel, do I sense God's peace about it? Do I sense God's peace about it? If you feel pressured, if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel confused about a decision that you're trying to make, it might be about money, it might be about some ministry in your life, it might be about your kids, and you're constantly feeling confused, one of the reasons for that is you're caught up in yourself probably and not in God's voice. The Bible says this about God. God is not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. He is not the author of confusion. So if I'm feeling confused, guess what? It's some other voice. It's not God's voice speaking in my life. Those of you that are parents, do you want, do you want your kids to feel pressured or confused when you ask them to do something? No, you want them to understand what to do and then respond and do it. And God's the perfect father, so he wants us to understand what he's asking us to do. Do I sense God's peace about it in my life? Now, the, the only time pressure could be legitimate is if God's told me to do something and I keep saying no. Then the pressure does build. But there's always peace when I say yes to what he's asked me to do. Satan wants to drive us compulsively and God wants to draw us compassionately. Satan wants to drive you compulsively. I think we've all got some OCD in us. And Satan wants to take advantage of our compulsions and use those to drive our lives. But God, instead, he wants to draw us compassionately. He's like a good father. He's like a good shepherd. He wants to draw our lives. Do I sense God's peace about it? I've always loved what Peter Lord used to say. 90% of what God wants to say to you is encouragement. And if all you ever hear from God is negative messages, something's wrong. The wires have been crossed. Do I sense God's peace about it as I'm listening to him? If you're trying to figure out what God wants you to do and you feel like God's told you to do something and increasing anxiety is happening because of what you feel he's told you to do, something's crossed up because the Bible says this in Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Here's how, how God speaks. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. If you do this, you will experience God's peace which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. When God speaks, I learn from him because I have his peace in my life. But notice in that verse it says, if you do this, you will have God's peace. It's not just a matter of hearing from him, it's also a matter of acting on what you hear. In fact, I... I love this next verse. Proverbs 22, verse 17 tells us the three things we need to do as we hear God's voice, hear God's impressions. Listen to this wise advice. Follow it closely, for it will do you good. And then you can pass it along to other people. So it's not just hearing from God. You do these three things. First, you listen, you hear it. But then you follow it, you do what it says, and then you pass it on to other people. Yesterday, when I was studying for this message, I was in my office and uh, Cassidy, my five-year-old granddaughter, walked in. She said, what are you doing, Papa? And I said, I'm preparing to teach tomorrow at church. And she said, uh, what are you going to teach on? And I said, 
how to hear God speak to you. She said, oh, I already know that. <laughs> I said, oh, you do? She said, yes. I said, does God speak to you? She, she, said, she said, all the time. I said, how does he speak to you, Cassie? He said, in my mind. Why is it so hard for adults and so easy for kids? Why do we make it so complicated? Because of all of our doubts and our fears and our skepticisms and all of the mess that we get into our minds, it's why Jesus said, if you want to understand the kingdom of God, you must become like a little child. Because a little child is open. Oh, God, whatever you want to say to me. And she could hear God very clearly. And she didn't have any problem with that at five years of age. Now what is it? What's the problem if you could hear God clearly in the past, but it's not so clear anymore? I mean, the transmission has gotten fuzzy. The lines are messed up and jammed. The message is muted. It's not getting through. What's the problem if you could hear God clearly in the past, but you can't now? Here's the problem. You have allowed sin to come between you and God. And you need to pull out that blockage and then you'll be able to hear him clear again. It may be a relationship you need to let go of. It may be a habit you need to let go of. It may be a hurt that you've held onto and said, I am not going to let that person off the hook. And that has created a barrier between you and God. And God can't hear your prayers and you can't hear him speak to you. And what you need to do is confess that area, that blockage, say, God, that's wrong. And I want to confess it and I want to change. I want to turn away from my my sin, I want to turn back to you. I want to be able to hear from you and you'll be able to hear him again. Well, what if I've never, ever heard God speak to me in my life? I've never felt it. Then you need to get to know Jesus Christ. You need to begin a relationship. You may have been in church all of your life. You can have churchianity without Christianity. You can have religion without a relationship. You can know all about God and not really know him. Now we can settle that one right now. The Bible says this, the last verse in your outline. He who belongs to God hears what God says. That's the mark that you belong to God. You can hear him. The reason you don't hear is that you don't belong to God. You've never been saved. You've never been born again. You've never stepped across the line in faith. You've never put your total life in his hands. You've come with your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or girlfriend. You may have come to Saddleback for years, but you've never began that relationship. And this is the day to do it. Let's bow our heads. I'm gonna pray a prayer right now. And if you've never heard God speak to you, you need to begin a relationship to him today. You can say something like this in your heart. Just follow me and say, me too, God. Dear God, I want to know you. And I want to hear your voice. And I want to know what you want me to do with my life. Jesus Christ, I don't understand it all. But I thank you that you love me, that you made me, that you shaped me for a purpose, that you forgive me and you take away my condemnation. Show me the things in my life that are keeping me from hearing you. I want to confess them and I want to get rid of them and I want to follow you and trust you from this day forward. I ask you to accept me into your family and help me to hear your voice and feel your presence. The rest of you who've you've already opened your life to Christ, you join me in this prayer. Say, dear God, I, I want to hear you when you talk to me this week. And more than that, I want to do what you tell me to do. I'm choosing your way in advance. 
and I want to pass on what you tell me to others so I can grow. Help me to use these seven tests this week as I listen to you. In your name I pray, amen.